this moment, during the famous International Horse Show in Aachen, Germany, attention is centered on one horse, a golden Palomino. He and his rider are a part of the United States equestrian team, competing against many of the world's best horses and riders. This is the last place one might expect to find a horse with a Western brand on his jaw. Working against the clock, the pair head into the towering obstacles before them. By all the rules and logic of horse breeding, this Palomino from the Western rangeland of the United States should be almost anywhere else but here. And yet he is holding his own against all competitors. The crowd has learned to watch the Palomino's flashing tail, for it is the barometer of his jumping. The higher the tail goes, the higher he jumps. This is his trademark. The course is a demanding one, but the golden horse seems to gather strength from some hidden wellspring of power. Not the power of a hot-blooded thoroughbred, but a power that had its beginning on that far-off western range. And although the golden horse from the United States has earned the admiration of the spectators, he was originally bred to be a cow horse, not a jumper. How did he get so far from home? Where did it all start? In the beginning, it was unfenced range in New Mexico and a six-day-old colt. His dam wore the jaw brand of the South Springs Ranch. Life was a new and exciting succession of days filled with wonder and experimentation, all under the watchful eye of his mother. Here at her side was the focal point of his life, his haven of security. Part of her function was to teach and guide, for there are obstacles to be overcome in life. At six months, with the harsh winter at hand, he was brought in from the range. He wore the long, shaggy coat that nature provided to protect him from the cold. In the spring, he shed the heavy winter coat, and he was turned loose to run the range again. soon earned him the name Injun Joe. There was corn here, intended for the Indians' livestock. But for a bold, inquisitive colt, this never presented any real problem. Until the day some young bucks plotted a counterattack.
was a story to be told and retold. A legend in the making. The story of Injun Joe, the yellow coat with the invisible wings. One day, Injun Joe, now in his third year, was driven from the range into the ranch corral. The cowboy singled him out of the herd. Until now, Injun Joe and man had gotten along pretty well, and he was prepared to be reasonable. But this was something else again. Suddenly, he and the man were on a different footing. There was a tenseness in the air, like a gathering storm, as the business of saddling the colt went on. You don't just walk up to a bronc that's never been ridden. If you're smart, you use the protection of the pickup horse and slither down onto the hurricane deck. With everything set, Injun Joe was turned loose. But the explosion never came. Injun Joe was a false alarm, a dog. <laughs> Throw him out. But the cowboy had an answer for that. He swung a spur, lit the fuse, and the blast-off came. <laughs> there was never a cowboy that couldn't be thrown, or a horse that couldn't be rode. But this was the day he learned he could fight back. Still, there were enough cattle, enough time, and enough work so that Injun Joe was broken to be a cow horse. And the memory of the earlier roughing up was buried in the day-to-day -day skirmishes with the range cattle. Action was something he understood. And he was a natural at this business of cutting out spooky Mexican steers. In fact, the cowboy wasn't well enough acquainted with Injun Joe to know that this was no time to start a cigarette, because Joe would take out after a steer no matter what. And when did a fence mean anything to Injun Joe? Cowboy's life was tough enough without riding a jumper. And maybe that's what this horse should be. Injun Joe's owner agreed. And the next day, Joe was taken to a place where he get a chance to jump. The nearby ranch of Colonel Anderson Norton. Colonel Norton, a retired cavalry officer, had an eye for a good horse. And he liked this one. Although the colonel had a reputation as an able horseman, he and many others recognized that it was his daughter, Sue, who had a singular quality, a certain special touch in training a jumper. A whole new phase of education started for Injun Joe, as Sue led him beside a well-mannered, more experienced horse. She used side reins to keep his head in the right position. And Sue Norton began to teach him the basic things a jumper must know the carefully regulated stride between fences, the rhythmic approach, the unhurried acceptance of a series of obstacles. Soon, Sue felt that it was time to school him with weight on his back. Through all this, she was aided by her father as they carefully planned each succeeding stage of Injun Joe's training. Injun Joe had never carried a rider like this one. Her firm, gentle hands told him what she expected of him. 
The pressure of her legs and the subtle shifting of her weight reassured and helped him. He wasn't an easy horse to train. Sometimes through youthful zeal, impatience, or most likely because he was Injun Joe, he decided to do it his own way. But power to be effective must be harnessed. And this occasioned some brisk passages between a willful horse and a skillful girl. Then one day, a couple from Virginia on a horse buying trip with their trainer saw the big yellow horse in action. The trainer agreed that here might be a prospect for the hunt field. It never occurred to Sue that these hunting people from Virginia would be interested in such an inexperienced jumper. But when they asked if he was for sale, she agreed to find out. Well, he was sold, and Injun Joe started to pack. The South Springs ranch outfit arrived to take him to the train. Now that the moment of departure had come, Injun Joe came into focus for Sue Norton. She was acutely aware of the raw talent that threatened to explode in all directions, and she felt more than ever his generosity and honesty. But she wondered if he would always find the extra understanding he needed to give his best. After the cow country of New Mexico, Injun Joe's new home in Virginia presented an entirely different way of life. Here, fox hunting is more than a pastime. It is an existence in itself, bound tightly to tradition, with a whole etiquette and set of customs of its own. Into this world bounded Injun Joe, already forgetting his recently interrupted schooling, as he realized that with this writer, he could have things his own way. Well-bred eyebrows raised at the sight of this unmannerly newcomer from the West. His conduct was so outrageous that even the hounds were nonplussed. fundamental rules of hunting demands that you never pass the master of foxhounds. But this was a nicety lost on Injun Joe. To him, the action of the hunt field was no different from a wild gallop across the New Mexico range. At the day's end, a well-bred hunter walks home sedately. But Injun Joe was neither sedate nor tired. As far as he was concerned, he was ready to start all over again. After a hunt, a flat-footed walk is expected and appreciated, but Injun Joe's incessant bounce was anything but a comfort to his rider. Injun Joe would never make a hunter, but his owners readily found a buyer who demanded only jumping ability in the horses he trained. To him, a horse was an article of merchandise. His business was to find horses with jumping ability, school them as quickly as possible, and sell them as show ring jumpers. At first, the horse took only a mild interest in the goings-on. But as he felt this new man studying him, a sense of dislike started building in him. The trainer knew that this man wasn't an ideal owner for a sensitive horse. 
but he had instructions to sell if the price was right. At first contact, Injun Joe boiled into resentment. But the man wasn't interested in what went on inside of Injun Joe. He had neither love nor respect for a horse. He was only interested in making a dollar. Injun Joe went on the defensive every time his new owner came near him. And his instincts were right, for the man met each resistance with unreasoning violence. Well, there was one way of fixing things so that the horse couldn't fight back. Just leave him alone and half starve him for a while. And so the months took their toll. And outwardly, it looked as though the plan had worked. But inwardly, he was still Injun Joe. His owner was ready to carry on the warfare in earnest. This was a jumping horse stable where every horse had to earn his keep. And this man would make Injun Joe jump or else. The horse hadn't looked for this fight, but it was being brought to him, and he was perfectly willing to carry on. Joe won the fight, but he lost it, too, because he was sold to a small riding academy where clumsy riders were the rule. If he hadn't earned his keep as a jumper, he was earning it now. Although he had nearly reached the bottom of the heap, underfed and overworked. It was still easy for Joe to flare into rebellion. And he lashed out at his existence by taking advantage of his riders. Joe made the ride at your own risk sign all too true. He was sold fast and cheap as a former jumper. And this time he came into the hands of a professional jumping horse rider. By now, Joe gave trouble to any rider whose will crossed his own. But this boy not only stayed with him, he actually reawakened in the horse the will to jump. Once again, the Palomino horse's natural jumping ability became apparent. And it caught the eye of a leading professional trainer. And so again, Injun Joe changed hands. This time, he had an owner who believed that conditioning was of prime importance, and food was the foundation. Joe couldn't have agreed with him more. And the bones disappeared beneath the rounded contours of a well-fed horse. The name of Injun Joe began to spread. brought Hugh Wiley, a member of the United States equestrian team, to a small but important Eastern show. Wiley was searching for a jumper he could use on the team. And as he watched the Palomino, he recognized that although this was an inconsistent horse, he might have some of the qualities of an international jumper. Still, a nagging doubt perturbed him. News spreads rapidly in the horse world, and Hugh Wiley 
had heard of the ups and downs in Injun Joe's life. Like others before him, he felt the potential brilliance, but the question of how it might be developed bothered him. To dispel his doubts, there was Bert Denemothy, the coach of the equestrian team. A skilled trainer of jumpers, Denemothy had seen Injun Joe in action. He believed in the horse. His problems could be solved, and Wiley was the rider to do it. So Injun Joe became a member of the United States equestrian team, the horses and riders who represent their country in international jumping competition. The team's training headquarters were in Greenwich, Connecticut. As a new door opened in Injun Joe's life, Hugh Wiley and Bert Denemothy agreed that there was something kind of likable about this crazy yellow horse. Now, Joe became the subject of meticulous care by a man whose quiet hands communicated skill and experience. Joe was curious about the amount of equipment necessary to take care of him. The whisker trimming wasn't too bad. But the business of having your ears worked on, well, that was something else again. The all-important care of his feet didn't bother him at all. But the trimming of his mane, although it wasn't painful, definitely tickled. There seemed to be no end to the attention that was lavished on him. And the whole thing was enough to make a horse laugh. A gray horse, Master William, was Hugh Wiley's number one horse. The previous year, he had won the coveted King George V Cup in London and had had a distinguished show record. Injun Joe may have been Wiley's second string horse, but Master William accepted him as an equal. The jumping squad of the United States equestrian team is made up of four of the most capable young riders in the country, all amateurs. Coaching the group is Bert Denemothy, a former Hungarian cavalry officer. And the captain of the team is Bill Steincross, an investment analyst who is one of the finest riders this country has produced. Another rider is Frank Chapeau, who is a leather salesman when he's not training with the team. George Morris, the youngest member, has interrupted his education to represent his country. And these riders, together with their coach, train for the international competitions that lie before them. This is the group that Injun Joe has joined. But he's no longer Injun Joe. Hugh Wiley, recently out of the Navy, has renamed him Nautical. The name Nautical wasn't the only thing new for him. He wasn't put to jumping immediately. But he watched Chapeau school over carefully spaced fences. This calm, scientific approach to training was new to him. He saw Steinkraus working over a big fence. But for Nautical himself, there were long hours of just quiet work designed to relax and supple him, to overcome the belligerent attitude he had so often displayed. They knew he could jump. That would come in due time. And in due time, it did come. Nautical made his first appearance in competition with the team at a top flight Eastern show. And now, once more, he was putting all of his heart into his jokes. Denemothy's training and Wiley's riding was paying off. The day came when the team was to fly to Europe for even greater tests in the fire of international competition. This airport business could have been an unsettling experience, but along with a new name, Nautical had become a new horse. Those around him had rebuilt his confidence. Since a horse can't be expected to fasten his seatbelt, each one wore a padded helmet for protection. And because a jumper is only as good as his legs, 
Added insurance was guaranteed by the use of specially padded shipping boots. Whatever doubts Nautical may have had about boarding the big airplane were set to rest for the sight of his stablemate, Master William. So with one man at his head and the reassuring presence of another behind him, he entered the plane as if it were his own stall. The former cow horse, who had been Injun Joe, was about to take off on the biggest adventure of his life. Two horses had no more apprehension of the flight than kids in the back seat of the family car. The first stop was Paris. Tension mounted, and Wiley and Denemothy waited for their part in the drama just ahead. But Nautical, a tourist at heart, soaked up the sights and sounds of his first international horse show. Watching with amazement the wild, colorful spahis from French Morocco. International jumping started. The best horses and riders of a dozen nations were competing here. Nautical watched his team captain Steinkraus on Tsar d'Esprit cleverly maneuver the in and out course. The entrance of the golden horse from America awed the Parisians. This was Nautical's first test as an international horse. His mind was on his work and he accepted the big fences like a veteran. His cream-colored tail flashed upward like a flag each time he jumped. He did well, although he didn't place. The next stop was Aachen, Germany, and one of the world's biggest horse shows. Here, 50,000 spectators jammed the huge arena every day to see some of the best horses in the world. The Aachen show is always lavish with extra events, such as an exhibition of Germany's famous carriage and coach horses. Almost nothing would have surprised Nautical. But look at this. Belgian draft horses pulling Bavarian beer wagons. Before the jumping, Horses do not see the course, but the riders pace off the distance between fences, translating this into terms of speed and the length of their horse's stride. And Coach Denemothy helped the team, making suggestions as to the problems each jump presented. The officials were ready, and so was Nautical. The first horse knocked down a bar which cost him four faults, and the tension built. As Italy's Piero Denseo was turning in his customary flawless ride, Bert de Nemethy and his riders studied their rivals and discussed strategy. Nautical saw obstacles of a type he had never seen before. Like the water through which Frank Chapeau galloped on Sinbad. All 
although speed is imperative, a 1,200-pound horse moving too fast can get into a lot of trouble. A fall costs eight faults, and the clock keeps moving relentlessly as excessive time adds more faults to the rider's score. Hugh Wiley was a veteran of this game, but Nautical wasn't. Hugh knew that from here on, the pressure would be on the horse, pressure that would uncover every weakness that Nautical had. a formidable contender is Piero Tinseo of Italy. Here is a classic example of the contribution the rider makes. For the horse alone is not the answer. Tinseo typifies the best in horsemanship. Riding smoothly and with great tact, he judges carefully the demands of each jump, asking his horse for exactly that effort which will accomplish the task. a masterpiece of timing and control, the basis of the perfect collaboration between a fine horse and a great rider. Piero Dinseo has set the pace and given his rivals something to shoot at. Now it was time for number 260, Nautical of the United States. was interest in this odd colored horse from America. Riders like the great Fritz Tiedemann of the German team and Inseo, who was leading the competition, watched closely as Nautical, tense with the controlled power of a coiled spring, prepared to start his round. Again, Nautical's tail signaled his readiness to jump fast and big. was among those who placed. Although he hadn't won, Hugh Wiley was satisfied because Nautical had finished third in a field of 68. George Morris on Night Owl was second, with Italy the winner. Thank <laughs> you. 
But at the end of those trying Aachen days, Master William went lame. With London only a week away, a German veterinarian announced that the horse would be out of action for the rest of the season. The loss of Master William was a blow to the team. But it was more of a blow to Hugh Wiley. He had won the much prized King George V Cup the previous year with the Big Gray. Now, if he had to try for a second successive win, he had only nautical to carry him through. There were a few days of letdown on the Belgian coast before the team shipped across the channel to London. But although the past few weeks had exacted more from Nautical than he had ever given in his life before, there was still an overflowing exuberance about him, springing from the close bond which had emerged between horse and rider. the 52nd Royal International Horse Show of Great Britain, believed to be one of the greatest shows in the world today. Great Britain has to compete against riders from seven different nations, including Italy, Spain, France, Ireland, and the United States of America. In England, as on the continent, a Palomino horse is an unusual sight. United States is nautical, ridden by Mr. Hugh Wiley. Perhaps the White City show ring suited him, or perhaps he was reaching a competitive maturity. But in any event, the jumping talent of nautical seemed to come alive at London. Throughout the long week of the show, it was almost as if he couldn't do anything wrong. His tail flipping, ears cocked toward each successive jump, he flew over the biggest obstacles with an almost disdainful ease. Nothing seemed to bother him, and nothing stopped him. By the end of the week, he had performed so well, he joined the group of remarkable horses qualified for the King George V Cup. What had gone before was child's play. He had proven that he was a good horse. Now he had to prove that he was a great one. Back in New Mexico, he was lucky when somebody pulled a cockle burr out of his mane. Now he was being done up to suit a queen's taste. For tonight, royalty would watch the King George competition. If the boys at the ranch could see him now. Now the competition is the King George V Cup. This undoubtedly is the most important competition of the Royal International Horse Show and probably the most coveted international trophy in the world. It is a very big course, over 14 fences, competitors from seven different nations competing. And Nautical coming in now turning around the last corner for the final straight of three fences with his tail waving like a ship of the ocean, its flag flying. It's almost as though it's a barometer of nauticals. When he waves that tail, you feel the higher it is, the higher he goes. Here 
there is Toscanella for Spain, written by Senor Goyaga, one of the great veteran champions of Spain today. Toscanella, a horse with a tremendous jump and likely perhaps to spring the surprise of the week by winning the King George the Fifth Cup. Eight fourths in 52 seconds. Nautical. When the first round was finished and all horses had jumped, Nautical and the great Spanish horse, Toscanella, were tied for first. A jump off was necessary. And Toscanella had gone first, jumping very fast. Still, the mare hit one fence and finished the course with four faults. Now the problem facing Nautical is a heartbreakingly simple one. If he can clear all fences without a fault, the King George V Cup is his. He can go slower than Toscanella if he chooses, but he cannot knock down a fence. Straight up, boy. Certainly not, not hurrying. And here they come in the spotlights. A horse that was surely designed for spotlights. Winner of the King George V Cup, Mr. Hugh Wiley, the holder of the Nautical United States of America. And the Cup will be presented by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Queen Mother. Princess Margaret and the Princess Royal have joined the Queen Mother. Now they walk across the bridge. Anna Clement, who won the Queen's Cup, Hugh Wiley, the King's Cup. And there is the Queen Mother waiting with the Duke of Belford, President of the Shell, to present the two trophies. People have won this great championship on two occasions, one of them being the great Colonel Llewellyn, who rode Fox Hunter, and the other Colonel Torbert Punsby. So Hugh Wiley joins an immortal band, and Old Nautical looks up proudly at the box of his rider as Her Majesty congratulates him. that the great nautical has been a true ambassador for the United States in Europe. <laughs> 